All right. Hello, everybody. It's Coach Mike McKay. I'm excited to have with me today uh, Roy from the Parts Badger. And uh, Roy shared with me that he races, but he didn't really share a whole bunch about it. Um, I'm going to ask him a question about that because if for no other reason, I think that's cool. Um, and I'm the guy doing the interviewing. So welcome aboard, Roy. Yeah, thanks for thanks joining us. Yeah, great to be here. I appreciate it. Give us a little bit about your background, your story, you know, where were you born, why you decided to start Parts Badger, and then we're yeah. going to talk about racing. Absolutely. So, uh, born Wisconsinite. Uh, I, I grew up in the Waukesha area, then I moved up to central Wisconsin, lived on a farm uh, through probably what you'd call like your formative years, you know, the early teens, middle school through high school. Uh, then went back down to uh, the Milwaukee area for college, uh, did undergrad yeah. at UWM, and then, um, yeah, started business after I graduated uh, there. Why did you start Parts Badger right away after you graduated? Or Yeah, so it's, it's funny that you bring up racing because probably my entire career um, is because of racing. So uh, when I was, uh, when I, as soon as I got my license, I wanted to race cars. Um, so at the time I was doing parking lot cone racing, really like that. I wanted to get into real racing, but real racing takes a lot of money. And as a college kid, especially a college kid that grew up on a farm, it's not like my family had a lot of money. I didn't have a lot of money. And the only way to make enough uh, while in college is really to start a business. So I started my journey as an entrepreneur. Well, uh, I'm gonna, let me stop you right there. I love mm -hmm. that comment um, because we work in the business world too. And my background is in the was in big business and I had no idea. And if you're listening to this and watching this and you have a uh, you know job somewhere and you're thinking about the entrepreneur world, listen to this. The only way to make big money um, is to get into business and it's amazing how much more both fun running your own company is um, and how much lucrative it is. So I just had to stop you on that. People, that's yeah. a misunderstanding people have. And so sorry to interrupt, but continue, Roy. Yeah, no worries. <laughs> uh, yeah, absolutely. So, you know, as a 19 year old, you know, needed to make enough money to pay for racing. So uh, I started salvaging uh, Miatas. So Mazda Miatas, I'd take them apart. I'd sell the parts. Um, hopefully for more than I paid for the, the car <laughs> and then do it over and over again. And then that paid for uh, a couple seasons of racing. And um, that was kind of my first taste of business. Um, after, uh, after that, while I was racing, I actually started to get into cameras in race cars. And I met my first business partner. Um, so we would, back then we actually had camcorders. So they were yeah, right. digital, but they were camcorders. And we'd have these little cameras that we'd plug into the camcorder so you could actually record your race. Um, so right oh, after college, cool. I ended up, yeah, working on that and, and uh, uh, running a company, selling cameras for race cars. That eventually pivoted into cameras uh, in aviation. So for general aviation uh, and then helicopters. Um, and as most businesses do, it's kind of an odd journey. So from that, you know, we needed to buy parts for our, our, at that time we were actually making recorders. So we needed to buy parts for the recorders. Those parts needed to be machined. And I found that to be an incredibly difficult process to buy parts. Um, I thought the process should be much simpler. Um, and that's really where we started off Parts Badger. And that was in 2016. And are you like machining, machining, hardcore actual machining parts, making them for people? Um, part of what we do. Yeah. So uh, initially the concept for the company, um, we started, we didn't have any manufacturing capacity. We worked through uh, a network. So we've set up a, a network of manufacturers, um, in now we're in China, Malaysia, Singapore, Vietnam. We have many in the United States. And then in this facility behind me, we have 15,000 square feet. We have several millions of dollars of equipment and we do in-house manufacturing as well. Um, but it started through a network and then we just built up. What we really see is we just want to connect the manufacturing capacity that makes the most sense to the innovators, whether those be engineers or people in su supply chain, buyers. Yep. We want to um, expedite the connection of that process. In some cases, it makes sense that we make the parts. In some cases, it makes sense that one of our partners does. Do you do like prototyping work or not prototyping? Yes, we do. do. We do a little bit of everything. So, 
Okay. One one of the reasons why we had such a hard time buying parts um, was because the market is very fragmented. So you're going to find shops that are prototype shops, shops that are production shops, shops that only work in aerospace, shops that work in oil and gas, yeah. and they're all small. So if you want to buy um, parts and you want to buy a suite of parts, um, it's very difficult to get those from one manufacturer. So that's what we're trying to solve. So we'll take pretty much everything. We have um, pretty much infinite capacity as far as what we could take on in our, our network, including our own manufacturing. So if it's a prototype or if it's production, regardless of industry, we're probably going to be able to make that part. That's awesome. I uh, We coach Napa, the company that owns Napa Auto Parts, and they pride themselves on the long tail mm -hmm. and parts being around for a long time, but they also outsource a lot to custom shops because some stuff just is not made anymore. And mm -hmm. the ability for you know somebody like you all to come in and do some custom work is awesome. So. Yeah. So you've answered half of the questions on the list already, but tell me a little bit more. Uh, one of the racing uh, comments that you uh, brought up was endurance racing and that mm -hmm. some people from the company participate on your team. Yeah. So, um, you know, there's a lot of great series out there now to do road racing at tracks like Road America. Um, Watkins Glen is a pretty famous one. Sebring yep. down in Florida. So uh, what we do, we're, we're part of this uh, group. We have a team. We call it Team Parts Badger. We have a car. And uh, yeah, employees help out. They either crew, we have some that drive as well. And we participate in races between seven and 24 hours long. Usually we're racing against, you know, 40 or actually the last race I was at, we're racing against 85 other cars over the course of seven hours. And, um, you know, it takes a lot of teamwork uh, to put that together. And as a driver, you get a lot of seat time, which is a lot of fun. Uh, but we do driver changes, we do pit stops. There's a lot of strategy. And then obviously a lot of mechanical work on the car. And the series allows development on the car too. So it kind of utilizes all of these different skill sets. So yep. it's a lot of fun. So is it, is that uh, like part of your unique hiring sauce that you guys get to socialize together as well? Or is it just kind of a natural outcome of what you do? Yeah. So we, we have a saying, it's not within our formal uh, values or hiring process, but we say parts badger, the place for cat people, car people, and all around audacious mofos. So I don't know nice. if I can say that on this channel, but uh, we actually have a shirt. Yeah, we have a shirt that says that. I, I think that's our informal culture. Um, just a lot of car people, but generally we're looking for people that uh, are team players, uh, people that um, understand that mistakes are normal. They're willing to accept responsibility of their mistakes, work as a team. And uh, those individuals really thrive in the culture here. And yeah, that definitely translates over to, uh, to race. Yeah. You're going to be the top interview because that's another thing that we talk with people a lot. Right? One is you make more money if you run your company. The other is culture, 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 culture. And um, again, if you're listening and you you have hiring issues, or if you have challenges with people, the number one way to get past that is to have an attractive place to work. And the attractive place to work is generally a lot more about what kind of culture you have to offer. Yeah, so, yeah, for ahead. sure. And, and if I could just kind of dive into yep. that point, so. Um, you know, what we really found in, in developing the culture and, and what I kind of saw is that's different than some other places where, um, you know, other people may have worked before and they come here and it's so different. The number one thing we teach all of our managers in management training is your first job is to actually care, to actually give a, you know what, about your, your people. Um, you need to actually care about who they are, what they're going through, what they're trying to achieve. And until you do that, you can't manage. Um, from there, once you have that foundation of caring, uh, which we have bi-weekly one-on-one, so everybody gets to really know each other really well, um, we make sure that people are taken care of at home, uh, people's lives, you know, if they got a sick kid, they're not going to be able to put in their best work. If they have a housing situation that's unstable, that's going to uh, affect their work. So you as a manager need to help facilitate to make sure they're, they're, they're poised to achieve their best work. And then from that, we really build up the culture from there. But it really starts from that place of caring. And if you want to retain people, that's a good way to do it. I mean, just the fact that you do management training is mind-blowing compared to most companies that are out there. Where, like, where did you come up with the philosophy that you just, like, it's directly aligned with the way we look at the world. We, we think only small business cares about the communities that they're in. 
Um, so that's the people that we work with too. But mm -hmm. did somebody push you along that path? Did you just naturally grow up on the, you got to care to be a leader? Like how did that come about? Yeah. So, um, to be honest, I, I love business as a science. Um, so, um, me and at the time, um, you know, one of our first employees, we worked together on really researching and trying to understand what, what is the essence of motivation? And we really started at Maslow, a uh, hierarchy of needs. And then it went to um, McClellan and Aldoffer and then Ryan in DC. And then from that, we kind of build up this philosophy of intrinsic motivation. And I think you see that a lot in management philosophy from like Andy Grove at Intel really spun off a lot of management work into um, you know Google and then Facebook with OKRs. But a key part of that was this one-on-one. -on -one. And the mm -hmm. key part of that was like actually caring and meeting with them and seeing. So you you kept seeing this in successful businesses that successful businesses know their people, they care about their people and makes make sure that they're intrinsically motivated. So we just built our system around that and said, look, how do we create intrinsically motivated people? And it's people that are taken care of, you know, from a hygiene perspective, safety, security, you know, home situation, financial. Sure. After that, do they feel like they're part of the group? Do you give them the autonomy to do what they're competent in? And do you make sure you're reinforcing that with praise and that you have fairness in your culture? Mm -hmm. And if you do all of these, you have intrinsically motivated individuals. And that's kind of what I was seeing reflected all around. So we, we built everything up from there. Is there somebody who was like a key uh, influence on you uh, other than the, all the authorship that you went through? I mean, it's a, like a murderer's row of leadership. And I'm, I'm telling you, we, this is mm -hmm. our living. Most people will not do that. Most people won't put that effort into it. Yeah. So, you know, and, and for me, you know, my passion is racing, but like I said, I, I really like business as a science too. So for me, I, I, I get my kicks off reading, learning new things and, and really experimenting. Um, but people along the way, I, honestly, there's like so many, it's hard to mention, but I mm -hmm. think I really started with, uh, the scale up Milwaukee program. Um, Elmer, um, Elmer Moore, I believe, was running that program at the time, um, and he really opened my eyes to, at the time, I didn't think I could manage. I, I didn't think I would be a good manager, and he really said, like, look, maybe, maybe you do have this. Maybe you could figure this out, and you can learn this, and then that really opened my eyes to, hey, I can learn to be a good manager, and I can figure this out, and then I just, the same energy I put it in, put into starting the business, it got put into, how do I become a good manager, and then how do I, 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 distill that into the culture and the team. Um, so I'd say he's part of that. We, I've been part of MMAC and their roundtables. That's been super helpful. Uh, lately, uh, Venture Mentoring Services, um, which Chris Abley's group uh, uh, had that program come in. We've been in that for about a year and a half. And then, I mean, really the team we brought through. So it's just been a number yeah. of influence throughout the, the community. Yeah. I mean, I like the scientific, science, science based. Um you know for us one of the things is what's your hypothesis if you're going to do that in your business what is the actual hypothesis and do we have the right testing plan in place so that you know if it's going to work and do you have the milestones and stick to itiveness to do something for 90 days to see if it's actually working or not yeah so for sure that's all awesome so what uh, what's the next big thing for you and your organization yeah so um Probably my word for that is audacity. Um, so when starting the company, it was very audacious. Audacious, audacious mofos, right? Yup. Yeah. So we started the company in a very audacious way, and we've grown the company in a very audacious way. And um, now we're really set up. Um, you know, we have a great team in place. Um, you know, we have the financial means. We have all the pieces that, um, you know, we want to fundamentally change manufacturing. So we've been, I think we're 21 months into a software development project. Um, where you know we're deploying things on the shop floor to basically automate quantity one. So in manufacturing, you know, robots have existed from you know right. the 80s, yep. you know, to automate large quantities, but that's not really where the consumer is headed. And that's not where innovation is headed. You need to to be more responsive and do smaller batches. So we really want to automate quantity one. Um, so we've been investing uh, a significant amount of resources in that. And we believe some of the things that we're doing will not only um, fundamentally change the cost of parts because of the amount of labor that's going to be injected will be substantially less, but we can also do same to seven day turn times. 
um, which is kind of unheard of in this industry. So um, I'm really excited about that. So that that's what's to come. We're, uh, uh, we've tested the program a little bit and we're, we're about to go live on that shortly here. Sweet. So here's the surprise question for you, but okay. I never tell anybody I'm going to ask this. Is there something you wish I would have asked you to talk about? Um, yeah, I think, um, you know, and, and, and you said some questions before, Hey, I might talk about this or that. And I think, you know, if, if this is for the budding entrepreneur, the individual that is thinking about starting a business, you know, how do you get started? You know, what should you focus on? And what I want to say is that there is a big difference between zero to one, one to 10, and then 10 plus for whatever scale you want that to be. Let's say it's employees. Let's say it's millions of revenue. Got but it. when you're starting a business from that zero to one phase, I would say be audacious. And like you said, with the testing, run a lot of experiments. So run dozens of experiments a day if you can um, and really try to be lean. Um, a great book is uh, Lean Startup by Eric Ries. Yep. Um, but anything you can do uh, to really rapidly test, because even when we started Parts Badger, I thought the business was going to be completely different from what it became. Uh, sure. But we ran a lot of tests and we really found out where the market was. We found out how to grow. If I were, which I put together a little business plan, the company ended up looking nothing like the business plan. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, business plans are really good for banks. Um, they're not good for running a business. In, right. in my opinion, especially zero to one. So that's what I would say. If you're thinking about making the leap and doing it, just be prepared to test a lot of things and be prepared to, to be excited and have fun and, um, you know, not not worry about everything being perfect. Um, just try, 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 try and be audacious. Yeah. Awesome. I really appreciate the time, Roy. Uh, Roy Deach from the Parts Badger. Um, you're the most, uh, I wish everybody could think like you and think about people and about the science of business that, you know, business is an entity of its own. Once you get more than a couple, three people there, it's just trying to do its job for you. Um, and just super exciting to hear somebody else working in that model of develop, 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 take care of the people. So really Absolutely. appreciate your time. Thanks yeah, for thanks, being Mike. part of the program. Appreciate the opportunity.